Whoa, lectures aren't what they used to be in my day. We used to come very seriously and very silently, and today in this lecture theater, it's buzzing, it's rocking. We've had every song you can imagine, but as usual, the students are still standing at the back when there's some free seats in the front. <laughs> some things stay the same, some things change. But it's absolutely fabulous to be here today, and I want to greet my colleagues and my friends at NMMU. Yanga, Sibele Kwana, you've done a wonderful job for us here for the past year as a leader. Thank you very, very much. And before I get to the next SRC president, let me talk a little bit about Ondela and Sma and Sam and Cabello and Kyle, who put such an enormous amount of work into this. Where's Kyle? I know everybody else except Kyle. Is he under the bunny? No. I want to say thank you very, very much to everybody who did that. And now I'm coming to Ulutando Mchobile. Ugwashu. Ugwashu. Pambili Gwashu Pambili. And it's fantastic to have our MP, Annette here, Annette Lovemore here, and all of our other colleagues, Celeste, and many, many other people here today all the DA faithful who have built up this organization over many years. And if I'd known this was a DA rally, I would have worn my blue beret. We've got a fabulous blue beret. <laughs> and we've had it for a lot longer than anyone else has had a red beret or any other color beret. But I thought in all seriousness, I'm coming to give a lecture about Stephen Bantubiku on the 36th commemoration of his tragic death in Port Elizabeth, because I couldn't come last year on the 35th. You'll remember that. I was invited, we'd set it all up, and suddenly the university said, no, you can't come. So we left it and we said, there's always a next time, because the struggle for freedom of speech and for democracy never ends. And now is the next time. And thank you very much for being here so that I can share with you some very important thoughts at this very important time for South Africa. So it is going to be quite a serious talk, but we are in serious times, and there are some very important and very serious lessons to learn from the legacy of Steve Biko, who lived a short while and like many, many great leaders, made more of an impact in his short years than most of the rest of us make in a full lifetime. And so we pay tribute, especially on the 12th of September, which is the exact date on which Steve Bantubiko died 36 years ago. And I would like today to talk a little bit about what that should mean to us today. I've just been to the Warmer Police Station, which became notorious throughout the whole of South Africa as the place where Steve Biko spent his last waking alive days. As you know, he traveled unconscious and naked, manacled in the back of a police vehicle to Pretoria. But his last conscious days were spent in the cell at the Warmer Police Station, and I've been to that cell several times. And if you stand in that cell and close your eyes for a while, you can think back to a time when a person was locked in between those four walls with no rights and with no hope. He couldn't see a lawyer. He couldn't see his family. He wasn't going to appear in court to make his case because he could stay there indefinitely without trial. Detention without trial was part of apartheid. He could be tortured as he was. He could be beaten and attacked as he was under interrogation. And no one in the world would know and no one would be there to protect him and no one would be there to expose what was going on. Now today it is really hard for us to think back to a situation of complete rightlessness and in that cell is a mural of Steve Biko, the very famous picture of Steve Biko. And last time I went, last year, it was frayed 
and it was peeling off the walls and it looked really terrible. And I'd like to thank those members of Darso who went back to restore that painting. It looks beautiful again, it looks powerful again, it looks strong again, and it does justice again to Steve Biko's legacy. So thank you very, very much. And as we were standing in the cell today, there was the grill. I'd never seen the grill when I was writing about Steve Biko, but there was a grill against which he was manacled. Sick and dying and beaten, they tied him to the grill with handcuffs. And the doctors who came to see him, the state doctors who were covering up for the police, said he was shamming. He was pretending to be falling into unconsciousness because he wanted to escape and he wanted to be taken to hospital. And that is why they refused to let him go. He hadn't committed a crime, he wasn't found guilty of anything, but he was rightless and powerless. And the doctors, to their shame, did not stand up for the oath they swore when they graduated from medical school and they failed to protect him. And that is why, quite correctly, the South African Medical and Dental Council subsequently struck them off the roll because that is where they deserved to be. And so, when we look back today, we understand what it means to honor your past, but we must also understand what it means to own your future because those two things have to come together in the present. If we don't learn from the past, we are bound to repeat its terrible mistakes. And the price of freedom is constant vigilance. Today we have a constitution. People can't end up in those situations, or not easily anyway. And we must never forget what it took to struggle and fight for that constitution and how important it is for each and every one of us to have its protection. And more than that, how important it is for each and every one of us to stand up for each other's rights and to learn that lesson of all time, that the price of freedom is constant vigilance. There's another timeless, timeless saying by Lord Acton, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so it is up to all of us, all of us, to maintain constant vigilance so that we can apply the essence of democracy, which is to hold our leaders to account. And so as we remember Steve Bantubiko, and as I remember as a very young journalist, not much older than any of you here today, covering that tragic story, and as I remember the bravery of the people who helped me get to the truth, the pathologist, the pathologist called Jonathan Gluckman, who helped me find the tests, the test results of the lumbar puncture they did on Steve Biko, which showed he had blood cells in his spinal fluid, which proved he had brain damage. So then we could go and write that he had brain damage and that he did not die of a hunger strike, as the security police tried to tell the world. And so, with the help of really brave people in difficult situations and in difficult places, we managed to get the evidence as the Rand Daily Mail to piece together the story that could tell the world that Steve Biko had been tortured, assaulted, and murdered, rightless in detention. And that must make us also happy that the media today can do their work with much more freedom. And we think, as we think of Steve Biko, of the many, many, many who died in detention. Imam Harun, Neil Agat, and countless others. And at that time, we didn't know that the struggle against apartheid would succeed. None of us knew it. We all thought that maybe this power is impenetrable and unbreakable. It would take 17 more years to achieve democracy. But it took many, many brave people in many places, some of whom lost their lives and paid the ultimate price to get there. Now your presence here today makes it quite clear to me that you also care a great deal about South Africa's future. There are many of you that support the Democratic Alliance and are members of the Democratic Alliance student organization, 
And I'm so glad about that, and I'm really glad that you're here. But I want to say an equal welcome, an equal warm welcome to those of you who do not support the Democratic Alliance. You'll always be welcome at our meetings. We believe in the open opportunity society for all. We believe in open debate. We believe in rational debate. And we also believe in listening to our critics because we don't believe that we're infallible. We can be wrong. We make mistakes. And if you listen to your critics with an open mind, you can learn a lot. And that is how progress happens. So I want to say to our opponents, you're especially welcome here today. And I hope in this discussion, we can find a way forward so that we can all do, in our judgment, with the limited knowledge that we all have, what we believe is best for South Africa to build one nation with one future. So, all of you who care about South Africa, thank you for being here. Because without overstating the case in any way, I do want to say that there are warning signs in our democracy today. There are serious warning signs in our democracy today. Let's look at some of them. I think you would all agree with me when I say that there is a widespread sense across our whole country of powerless and frustration amongst many, many people. And when I look at how it manifests, I think I can identify three main ways. I think there's a sense that our judicial institutions, our courts, our police, our national prosecuting authority are being weakened every day through political assaults on their independence. And that is a very, very frightening space for any country to be in. Because the key thing about a constitution is that everybody is equal before the law. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how rich you are, you obey the same law, and the law and its institutions, the prosecutors, the police, the courts, the prisons, treat you all equally. That is a very important principle. Because the minute it is possible for someone in power to use the criminal justice system to punish his opponents, to persecute his opponents, and to protect his enemies, then the country's in very serious trouble indeed. Because then the people can never, through their own free will, vote such a person out of office because such a person will always abuse his power through the institutions of the Constitution to destroy his enemies. And that is why those institutions have to always, always be independent. And that's why when Julius Malema was arrested for going to speak to a big meeting at Marikana, I said, this can't happen. He hasn't broken the law. He needs to go and speak. He has a right to speak, defended in the Constitution. If he breaks the law, then you can arrest him. But you can't arrest him on his way to give a speech, which he's entitled to do under the Constitution. And people said to me, why is Zilla standing up for Malema? I said, I'm not standing up for Malema. I'm standing up for Malema's rights. And there is a very big difference. There is a very big difference because, believe me, in a constitutional sense, an injury to one is an injury to all. An injury to one is an injury to all. And let me tell you why that is so. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who eventually died under Nazi Germany, came up with a wonderful, wonderful saying that is still well known everywhere and still forms the basis of the key constitutional idea. He was a pastor, a Protestant pastor, who died in Germany at the hands of the Nazis. And when he was sitting alone in prison, he wrote these famous words. He said, first they came for the Jews, and I did not speak up because I was not Jewish. Then they came for the communists, and I did not speak up because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I said nothing because I wasn't a Catholic. And then they came for me, and by then there was no one left to speak. And that is the insight under constitutionalism. I will defend Julius Malema's rights, 
as much as I defend any DASO member's rights, as much as I defend anybody else's rights to the protection of the Constitution, which includes freedom of speech, which includes the right to a fair trial, which includes all of the rights that we've struggled for and fought for for so long and for which people like Steve Biko gave their lives. And so we're seeing our judicial institutions being undermined, and that's a very, very serious warning sign to all of us. And then we have a sense that individuals aren't able to get the opportunities that freedom should offer them. And then we see more and more that leaders feel free to ignore what the people are saying and what they're thinking. And that's a very serious issue. And that comes from being in a situation where leaders believe they will never be voted out of power. And that is one thing that the old National Party shares in common with people today who say they will rule until Jesus Christ comes back. I don't have to tell you who says that. I don't have to tell you who says that. But the truth is that if you believe you can never be beaten in an election, then you're going to abuse your power and you're not going to give people the freedom they can use. And that is why elections are so important. And that is why the person on whose philosophies we ba base our economic policies, Amartya Sen, I don't know if you know about him, a very, very famous Indian economist, has said that freedom isn't helpful to people unless it is freedom they can use because they have a decent education because they have serious opportunities, because they live in a country with a growing economy that is offering more and more jobs, because there's health care, and all of those things that enable you to use your freedom. But let me also say that we can't use freedoms without a constitution that protects our freedoms. We can't use our freedoms without a constitution that protects our freedoms. That is the first line of fire. And so, where we have a rights-based constitution, we must think back and understand what a different situation we are in compared to where Steve Biko was. I don't know if people have got lectures or whatever, if they expected some kind of razzmatazz. But for those of you who want to hear the key lessons, I'm very, very interested in telling you about them. The first thing that we must understand is that it was no coincidence that Steve Biko was murdered a year after the Soweto uprising in 1976. Because the Soweto uprising signified the turning of the tide of power in South Africa. And at those moments, tyrants and undemocratic governments really are determined to crush any resistance. And Steve Biko was a great threat because he had such a large following and such a vision for the future. And that is why we saw the reaction. It was part of the strategy of the undemocratic and authoritarian apartheid regime to win time, as all tyrants do. And they sought to win time. And we must remember that when we look at what's happening today, we must be very careful for the similar signals that we need to see. So if we fast forward from 1977 to 2012 and think of that tragedy that unfolded in Marikana just over a year ago, 36 people killed, mostly by the police, in a situation that reminded many people of my generation, of Boy Patong, of Sharpville and Soweto. And we look at what happened there and we think that democracy is very, very fragile because just as the fight against those students in Soweto represented their determination to overcome their powerlessness, so the events at Marikana symbolized people who were outsiders, who were powerless, who were not included in the system. And that is because we have a big union, a big government, and a big company making the rules that excluded many other people. The Labor Relations Act said it was okay for the National Union of Mine Workers and Lonman, the company, and the government to get a deal that would enable anyone who didn't have above 50% support to be represented in the bargaining chamber. And so it excluded a whole lot of people who were outsiders, and they had no other way of expressing their concern and of engaging the process. 
And so we saw the consequences. It was violence escalating against the outsiders versus the insiders. Big government, big business, big unions, and the outsiders get so frustrated that they mobilize and take them on. And then we saw some elements of the same kind of cover-up that happened after Steve Biko died. When Steve Biko died, you know that the government tried to cover up and say he died of a hunger strike. Well, after the massacre at Marikana, we also saw the tragedy that the government sought to deal with the consequences in a way that I think caused grave questions in many people's minds. You will remember what happened with the photographs. The first photographs taken in daylight showed the miners unarmed, or mostly unarmed, and the next photos showed them with weapons of all kinds next to or on their bodies. And the big question is, how did that happen? And who put those weapons there? And what were they trying to convey in that process? A very, very serious issue. And so, we were very happy that we could have the swift exposure of the media. Journalists wrote about it. They exposed it. They showed the photographs next to each other to demonstrate that, in fact, in one situation, the people had no weapons, and in other situations, they did have weapons, and they could ask questions. And today, they could do it much more easily than the battle that I faced when I was trying to get to the truth of Steve Biko's murder. And so we must be grateful for the freedoms of the press that we now have. And today, we see that AMCU is the majority union, but sadly, they are continuing with the way of the past and excluding all other unions, creating a new class of insiders and outsiders. And while we talk about outsiders, let us look at the people who are the most marginalized in our society, and those are people who come from other countries and often feel they don't have rights. And let us think of the most vulnerable and marginalized, such as Mido Masio, the taxi driver who came from Mozambique, who was working in Ikureleni, and who was arrested by nine cops and dragged behind a vehicle and killed, being dragged behind a vehicle. Now, how can that happen in a constitutional democracy? Well, the nine policemen were arrested. They've just been released on bail. But it gives you an incredible warning. When policemen in a constitutional democracy believe they can deprive a person of his rights in that way. And that has to show to us that although we have a democracy and we have a constitution, the rights of the vulnerable and the rights of the outsiders are still so tenuous that they can be violated by people who are supposed to uphold those rights and uphold the law. And so, when we look at the extent of powerlessness in South Africa today, we have to say there are warning signs which we cannot ignore. If I were to ask any of you today, do you think that you would be likely to die in police detention? I'm sure you would say no. And I would also say no, because I think the Constitution has changed so much. So I was amazed to see that between 2011 and 2012, almost 1,000 prisoners died in detention. Now, obviously, many of them died of natural causes, and I can assure you one of them was not Shabir Sheikh. So many of them would have died of natural causes. But to think that 1,000 people died in police custody between 2011 and 2012 is a shocking statistic. And it is even more shocking when you think about the fact that somebody who said he was dying was released on the grounds that he was dying and is now well and up and about about four or five years later, which is a sham and which shows you what happens when the law and our institutions start being manipulated for political purposes. And that is what we have to guard against. And so the great thing about Steve Biko is that he never got used to it. He never accepted it. And you know the story about the frog in the water that gets warmer. It doesn't notice how much the temperature is rising until it is boiling and he dies. And Leo Tolstoy, that great writer, said, there are no conditions of life to which a man cannot 
get accustomed, especially if he sees them accepted by everyone around him. And except if that man is called Steve Beaker. He never accepted. He stood up and he fought. And we need to continue doing that today. That is why we in the Democratic Alliance are before the court for the fourth time now in our quest to get the secret spy tapes to find out whether the charges against President Zuma were withdrawn for legal reasons or whether there was political manipulation in our institutions of the criminal justice system and whether they were withdrawn for political reasons. That is why we've been trying to get to the bottom of the 70 billion rand arms deal in which we know there was a lot of corruption and that is why if the Sariti Commission does a cover up, we will fight it until we get to the truth. That is why we are so determined to get the report on Nkandla, the one that has been done not only by the public protector, but the one that was done by the oversight committee in parliament, but they won't bring it. They won't bring it to the public works committee because that's an open committee. They take it to the intelligence committee because that's a secret committee. And so we will fight these cover-ups of abuse of power and manipulation of our institutions, not because the DA wants to somehow get its name in lights, but because everybody's rights depend on it. Everybody's rights depend on it. And those of you who follow me on Twitter will know that when I talk about these things on Twitter, people say, are you trying to get votes? And my answer is, actually, we always try to get votes. Because unless we can beat the ruling party in an election and hold them accountable, we will never be able to stop this abuse of power. And after that, I hope the voters will continue to hold us to account, because that is necessary, because every single government must fear the voters. The minute a government thinks they are more powerful than the voters, that they can do what they like, and the voters won't hold them to account, you will get a repetition of the situation that led to the death of Steve Beaker. And that is what we must understand, that politics is important, it shapes everybody's life. And as I said this morning to my colleagues, if you are not interested in politics, politics will be interested in you, because slowly your rights will be gnawed away before you realize what is happening to you. So, when we look at our responsibilities now and our freedoms now, we must never take them for granted. We must defend them, we must stand up for them, otherwise history will repeat itself. And I want to come to the end of my talk so that I can take some questions before it gets too late. I want to come to the end of my talk by quoting Steve Biko's definition of black consciousness. He said, the first step, therefore, is to make the black man come to himself, to pump back life into his empty shell, to infuse him with pride and dignity, to remind him of his complicity in the crime of allowing himself to be misused and therefore letting evil reign supreme in the country of his birth. This is the definition of black consciousness. In 2013, we all need to heed Biko's teaching. Every one of us must be infused with pride and dignity and remind ourselves of the danger of being complicit with evil. And if we do not stand up for each other's rights, each and every one of us, we are by definition complicit with evil. And so that is the job that we have to do and we will continue to do it. And I'm so thrilled to see what Darso has achieved on the NMMU campus. I compare it to what I see tragically at the Walter Sisulu University. And I ask myself, what is the difference? Now, I can't claim to know the answer to that comprehensively, but very much part of the difference is leadership. And I think you saw today the kind of leadership you have here that enables to stand up for your rights in a way that wins ground, not destroys the potential of progress. And so I want to pay real tribute to the leadership that is here today.